welcome to this afternoon. Uh, well, I'm so sorry, this morning pl plenary session with uh, Professor uh, Hui Carvalho. I mean, it's a pleasure to be here with you virtually. Um, and we're going to listen to his uh, talk on Fomon Dune, entitled Passage Almost, Transit, History and Crisis in Fomon Dune. So for the ones who don't know uh, Professor Kui Carvalho, I mean, he, is, uh, he works at the English Department of Anglo-American Studies at the Faculty of Arts at Universidade do Porto in Portugal. He has published widely uh, on early modern English drama, Irish studies, translations, and world, word and image studies. He's also a literary translator and has published versions of Shakespeare, Anthony and Cleopatra, Richard III, and Love, Labors, Lost, Christopher Marlowe, Seamus Heaney, and Philip Larkin. So, now to you, Ahui, can you please? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Viviane. Delighted to see you again, albeit only on screen. And let me begin by offering my warmest thanks to all colleagues on the organizing committee and the board who have so kindly and flatteringly invited me to, um, uh, to give this lecture. Uh, and let me uh, hope uh, that uh, circumstances will allow us very soon to become mobile again, since mobility is also very much my topic today, to become mobile again and uh, start meeting uh, again face to face at the various academic venues in which we have regularly been converging. Now, uh, for this short lecture, I'm finally, in fact, developing and revising in light of Muldoon's more recent work, a line of critical argument that I began sketching some 20 years ago in the wake of the publication of Muldoon's Clarendon Lectures that came out in the year 2000, lectures that he had given at Oxford in 1998. Now, that year is not immaterial to my topic. Let me share screen and start, uh, you know, giving a, uh, a visual uh, support to some of these remarks. So the Clarendon lectures in 1998. That year, as I was uh, arguing, is not immaterial to my topic, nor was it, most importantly, to Muldoon's theme and declared intent on that occasion. As the political aftershocks of Brexit have recently been reminding us, um, 1998 was, of course, the year of the Good Friday Agreement, and the level of attention then obtained globally by the culmination of the peace process made it predictable that an Irish poet lecturing from a seat of academic Englishness should focus on what he saw as an Irish theme. This emphasis was to be explicit in the title he chose for the volume that compiled the lecture series. The title was To Ireland I. This volume, as I was saying, came out two years after that uh, lecture series. By then, by the year 2000, Muldoon had been elected Oxford Professor of Poetry. Uh, as you can see on this list, a position that he occupied for that five-year term from 1999 to 2004. And this made it even more pointed that he should borrow his title for that lecture series uh, from the English bard, from Shakespeare, uh, from a passage in Shakespeare's Macbeth, Act 2, Scene 3, in which Donald Bain announces he will be fleeing he will be escaping to Ireland, I, and Donald Bain remarks, our separated fortune shall keep us both the safer. This allusion to hazardous crossings and a duress combined with a sardonic suggestion that safety depends on keeping one's distance was confirmed by Muldoon's commitment to exploring in those Oxford lectures uh, what he called a range of strategies devised by a range of Irish writers for dealing with the ideas of liminality and narthicality, well, borderline conditions that he believed central to the Irish experience. For him, Irish writing reveals, again in his words, an attraction to a, a critically positioned figure, 
a figure who is neither here nor there at some notional interface. So liminality, transit, and vicarious expression, signifying through a borrowed utterance, as in that title taken from Shakespeare, to Ireland I. Muldoon's writing, as we know, is characteristically citational, translational, marked by indirection. In my brief overview today of some of his poems, I will be privileging, however, the space that such notions occupy within Muldoon's referential range rather than the enactments that the same notions uh, occupy uh, and encounter in his circuitous and appropriative textuality. I'll be arguing then that the poet's representations of selves in their relation to location and territory bring out a sustained but evolving engagement with boundaries, boundaries that are preserved and or transgressed also in the etymological sense of transgression as stepping across, border crossing. And I want further to argue that this, this emphasis has marked Muldoon's poetry from his earlier work to his more recent books, such as 1000 Things Worth Knowing that came out in 2015 and Frolic and Detour that came out two years ago. Uh, books towards which I will gradually be moving uh, in the course of this lecture. Now, such representations often involve what I will call the liminal moment, an awareness of a divide or space of transit characteristically followed by a sense of indefinition that is either unsettling or exhilarating, or both in succession. And this has a consequence that Muldoon construes as emotional or intellectual, entailing a changed or inflected attitude to experience and perceived reality. In Muldoon, what I'm calling the liminal moment may appear suspended in time uh, and space, or on the contrary, it may be clearly situated. It is often presented in an ostensibly careless and offhand manner even when, to the ostensibly autobiographical persona, that moment concerns relevant or even defining and life-changing circumstances. These include, uh, in some of his earlier work, uh, his father's half-fabled and ultimately failed project to emigrate to South America. How, in the line from which I borrowed my title for today's paper, he, quote, took passage almost for Argentina, a line from Imrama, uh, a poem originally included in a collection back from 1980. This transit to the other hemisphere, uh, described as unfulfilled within lived experience, is however accomplished in the poem. It's accomplished imaginatively, but also contingently with the limitation, quote, he has gone no further than Brazil. Now, this is a teasing, elusive geography. Imrama, the poem's title, refers to old Irish tales of heroic westbound voyaging, which inevitably brings up the homonymy set up by Brazil. Also, as so often mentioned, and you will, of course, be very much aware of this, also the name of a utopian island off the west coast of Ireland, which survived in received knowledge until the era of early modern cartography, as late as that, and indeed featured in Ortelius's map of 1572, that name Brazil tantalizingly afloat just west of actual Irish place names, Donegal, Galway. Now, Imrama first featured in the intriguingly titled collection, Why Brownlee Left, a book that pointedly included poems on uncertain transits, but also uncertain borders. Uh, and a book that blurred the divide between the imaginative pool of myth and the ostensible objectivity of history. This was in evidence in a poem that may be familiar to many of you, a poem in, entitled The Boundary Commission. It's a historically loaded title under which the poem defamiliarizes the phrase and the boundary to which it refers by balancing an impossible absolute 
against the historically contingent. And I quote, you remember that village where the border ran down the middle of the street with the butcher and baker in different states? Today, he remarked how a shower of rain had stopped so cleanly across Golightly's lane. It might have been a wall of glass that had toppled over. He stood there for ages to wonder which side, if any, he should be on. The piece is one of the sharpest evocations in Irish writing of the absurdities that follow the 1921 partition. Absurd it is that the short-lived boundary condition was expected to smooth out of the post-partition territory to no avail. Such absurdities persisted for decades, already during World War II, as described by Peter Leary in his Unapproved Roots, Histories of the Irish Border, 1922-1972, a book that came out five years ago. Well, as described by Leary in this volume, in small localities on the border, such as Patigo, County Donegal, and I quote, one side of the town was blacked out in total darkness because it was at war, uh, while the other in the free state, which was neutral, glittered brightly. Muldoon's poem juxtaposes the border reference metonymically with an unlikely natural phenomenon turned also into an absurdist representation of sectarian division in its intractability. After 1998, such tales of the Irish border seemed to become quickly a thing of the past, remembered as intriguing, if not outright funny, as if the success of the peace process and freedom of movement within the EU ensured an end of history scenario. Curiously, in 2015, by coincidence, a mere year before the Brexit referendum, Muldoon made a point of again shedding light on the border in a poem addressing Rita Duffy's Watchtower 2, uh, a, a work of art uh, dated 2006, reproduced on the cover of Muldoon's uh, collection, uh, 1000 Things Worth Knowing. The painting, Rita Duffy's painting, is an eerie, hyper-naturalistic representation of the heavy apparatus that used to dot the border at the height of the troubles, contrasting starkly with that easy prettiness of Irish rural landscape. Duffy's naturalistic rendering of the green natural setting is construed in the poem as, in fact, depicting a uh, territory that is occupied and muffled in a military cover. And I quote, it looks as if the whole country is spread uh, under a camouflage tarp rolled out by successive British garrisons. Muldoon reminds us with these lines that this draws on the nationalist view of things by referring to a set of formative stories by early 20th century educator and revolutionary leader Patrick Pierce, executed in 1916 for his role in the Easter Rising. As teenagers, we worked our way through Isagon Agus Skelta Elle. The territory thus receives the inscription of different and politically charged shades of the same color. And I quote again, our vision of four green fields shrinks to the olive drab, the Brits row over everything. The poem's humorous pondering of shades of green includes an anecdote of economic integration through transgression, a story, a perception of things that in 2015 was regressive, drawing on memories of a by then effaced border. Uh, 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 but uh, in the post Brexit dispensation, the anecdote now seems uncannily prescient, fuel shortages included. And I quote One advantage of a farm that, as they say, bestrides the border is how industrial diesel dyed with a green dye ferries itself from the south into the north by force of gravity alone. Now, the sardonic speaking self rejects the label of 
common criminals, the phrase you find a couple of lines below, for those like him involved in this smuggling of green dye fuel. But the toings and froings, that's what I want to, to stress, the toings and froings of a disputed land and the murky historical narratives that envelop it will not allow anyone to emerge untainted as with the staying power of the green dye. And I quote again, it infiltrates our clothes. It's impossible to budge. So these musings on green might suggest a strictly local, even ethnocentric focus. Were it not for Muldoon's unusually explicit equation of Irish border woes with other territorial plights. And that, let me quote a few uh, uh, additional lines. We're not the first tribe to have been put down or the first to have risen against our oppressors. That's why we've always sided with the Redskin and the Palestinian. This quasi manifesto like tone is, however, promptly qualified by the sardonic. It must be because steroids are legal in the North, but not the South, the Brits like to eavesdrop on our comings and goings. But an equation with adversities involving borders elsewhere was fully in evidence, in fact, much earlier in Muldoon's writing, or considerably earlier, let's put it in these mitigated terms, even if the implications of such adversities were less explicit. Um, uh, and I'm thinking of earlier poems such as Unapproved Road from My Sand and Gravel, a collection that came out in 2002. Uh, and the poem Unapproved Road included the lines, when we came to the customs post at Onacroy, or as at Kellerville or Padigo, I was holding my breath as if I might yet again be about to go underwater. This passage shows Muldoon combining a playful and deflationary mode with an intertextual and parodic edge, as if, as if to superimpose an authorial drift with territorial tropes. Since those lines from An Approved Road echo the famous liminal moment in Seamus Heaney's much quoted from the frontier of writing, those lines that you also find on the slide, at the bottom of the slide, uh, those lines uh, uh, about the, the suspense and angst of going through checkpoints, those much quoted lines. So you drive on to the frontier of writing where it happens again, and then you get that image of the, wa of the waterfall and of going uh, uh, underwater suddenly or through a rain yet freed as if you pass from behind a waterfall on the black current of a tarmac road. Of a tarmac road. Um, uh, uh, now, uh, the phrase in Muldoon's title, an approved road, was of course formally applied to illegal border crossings in post-partition Ireland. But the poem, an approved road, uh, also has a mysterious persona, the Tuareg, who describes the migration of his flock tending forebears, and I quote, through Algeria, Mali and Libya, all the way up to Armagh, Monaghan, and Luth, with a total disregard for any frontier. So despite the wordplay and the equally playful conflations of time and place, combined with an inter-authorial but also intra-literary challenge, as we saw a challenge to, to Heaney's from the frontier of writing, no less than that. So despite all of this, Muldoon thus proves recurrently alert to civic plights in a variety of challenging geographies, as suggested by the alliterative toponymy that you get in those lines, uh, uh, African and Irish, you know, Algeria, Mali, and Libya, Armagh, Monaghan, and Luth sort of mirroring each other across that line. Such pointed breadth of reference carries an implicit rejection, if not critique, of an ethnocentric approach to a national narrative. And this marks the manner in which 
Muldoon's recent writing has included commemorative verse responses to the key historical developments of a century ago. I'm very much aware of this commemorative dimension also as regards the overall theme, the chosen theme for, uh, for this very exciting symposium. So commemorative verse responses, as I was saying, included in some of Muldoon's more recent collections, responses to those key historical developments of a century ago, ranging from the 1916 Easter Rising, as with the uh, Patrick Pierce citation noted above in connection with the, uh, the poem on the, the, the Rita Duffy painting, uh, from that, from the Easter Rising to the years of war and partition. Some of those responses feature prominently in Muldoon's latest collection, Frolic and Detour, published in 2019. Now, the title, maybe I will be telling you the obvious, maybe not, but the title is a legal phrase applied especially to the behavior of an employee who deviates from an expected itinerary and then engages in transgressive behavior for which employers will have no legal uh, responsibility. Uh, uh, let me cite, you know, from a fully authorized uh, legal source, this comes from the Legal Info Information Institute uh, uh, at the Cornell Law School, explaining that, and I quote, frolic and detour is a phrase describing actions taken by an employee that fall in varying degrees outside of the scope of employment. Generally, a detour constitutes a minor departure from an employee's duties, but is still considered acting within the scope of employment, whereas a frolic would be a major departure from the scope of employment undertaken for that employee's own benefit. Well, well. So again, an unapproved route, if you want, with the additional implication of truancy, waywardness, obligations not met. So the phrase bears sardonically on the roughly 120 pages of verse to which it refers. And it is under such a title that Muldoon engages with history and current affairs in writing that, again, refers to borders, literal or otherwise. This includes reflections on the lexicon for transit and intersection, for example, I was insisting athwart has been a synonym for crosswise. You get here a sort of ostensibly pedantic preoccupation with getting the, the right word, you know, the more juste, uh, which is in fact prompted by a slanted reflection on narratives of origin and claims on land or territory. Such claims may revealingly, ironically, be small and yet consequential, as in this allusion, at least since Helgi Rolfson laid claim to his sandpit, an allusion to the initiative of a ninth century Viking settler, with all the implications that a Viking reference carries for the territories and cultures, Irish and American, between which Muldoon has personally and poetically shuttled since the 1980s. Elsewhere, in Frolic and Detour, you get an uncanny juxtaposition of Irish settings and a variety of elsewheres, deepened, that gets deepened by parodied myth and, again, chiming toponymies. As in these lines from Wave, a poem set off by a visit to Hungary. These lines that you see now on the screen, from time to time, a big-breasted woman has been known to dive into the headwaters of the Danube and return to the fold in Ireland itself between the paps of Danube. You get here those chiming toponymies that I was referring to moments ago. Now, in this, as in other poems, there's an over-explicitness that I was noting in some of those lines on the Rita Duffy painting from the previous collection, 1,000 Things Worth Knowing, this persists in Frolic and Detour. And it is balanced once more against a self-deflation, a self-deflation you know, of the persona served by contrived rhymes. Let me quote you uh, a bit more. I happened to be putzing around in the gallant spy in Budapest while you did your very best 
to hold on to the world brim. There's a sort of deliberate quasi doggerel here that, however, sets its humor off against the pathos of the world's adversities, hinging on borders and the lethal seriousness of current mobility crisis. I was stretched in a thermal bath, even as Syrian refugees struggled to find a path across the border at Zakay. The target for the uneasy humor is evident in these and other lines. And the target is an admittedly autobiographical persona that is all too aware of the successful Western and Northern, as in from the global North, the Western writer's privileged lifestyle. He had glimpsed in another geopolitical hotspot, Hungary, for migrant phobia, as also for past atrocities. And this persona is self-satirically exposed through ludicrous adjacencies. Let me quote a bit more. I lay now in my hired canary swimming togs in an outdoor pool, a pool renowned for being the first to feature a wave machine. The burial mound of the Dohani Street Synagogue dates from 1945. The discursive flow is here delusive, as readers are shocked by what a former mentor of mine, uh, the poet and, and, and scholar Joaquim Manuel Magalhães, what he used to call an abrupt metonymy, you know, here uh, instanced by this juxtaposition of the wave machine in this uh, 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 fan environment, in this setting for, you know, uh, outdoor life and entertainment, the wave machine and that burial mound uh, of the synagogue. An abrupt metonymy when you get these starkly contrasting but juxtaposed references signaling that an apparatus for sport and fun, the wave machine, was in fact contemporaneous with dismal burial arrangements from the era of the Holocaust. This glaring self-exposure of the uh, gallivanting, leisure-rich persona, here self-satirized in his canary swimming togs, determines the conditions of Muldoon's authority for pondering the borders and contested territories of Ireland and the world in his recent writing. Known for his reluctance to credit the power of poetry to make things happen to echo the terms of Auden's famous dismissal, poetry makes nothing happen. Now, Muldoon closes wave this poem on atrocities, glimpsed from that glorified swimming pool for the privileged. He closes the poem with a line on the impossibility of escaping, and I quote uh, again, the force of that, of that much anticipated and expected a wave. The oxymoron, this compound qualifier that you get split or conjoined by that comma, you know, anticipated, unexpected. Uh, this oxymoron pays tribute to the challenges posed by contemporary experience, as also by a writing that persists in, well, making waves. These have continued to sway Muldoon's verse, not as a reflection of a manifesto-like denunciatory writing, but rather through a sustained dual effect. And these will, in fact, already be my uh, final remarks. A sustained dual effect involving Muldoon's fashioning of personae, a persona or several, and his confrontation of the world out there. So this dual thing, fashioning a persona, confronting the world out there. As regards the latter, you know, the world out there, Muldoon exposes a broad range of iniquities and cruelties, alternately petty and outrageous in their scale. And he does this with great candor. Their absurdity, the absurdity of those iniquities, highlighting by how incompatible they are with any politically acceptable construction of the human, as also by a pervasiveness brought out by 
those conflations of space and time that explode any known chronology and geography. As regards his prevalent persona, it has tended to combine a mock duteous focus on knowledge and its acquisition, as suggested by his 2015 title, 1000 Things Worth Knowing, and a recurrent self inculpation as wayward and truant, that defendant who pleads guilty to frolic and detour, the title of his 13th major collection. So this dual effect has allowed Muldoon to honor a sense of writer responsibility equated with expressive independence, while also acknowledging, as regards the territory and culture of his origins and the world that frames it, acknowledging the challenging century behind us with its rich ballast of both cultural enablement and politico-historical perplexities. Thank you very much, and I'll be delighted to engage with any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fui, for this excellent talk. Uh, it's it has been very, very interesting to 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 see how Muldoon has been developing these very contemporaneous themes. So just thanking everybody who's watching from YouTube, Giselle, Mariana, Vitor, Camila, Laura. Um, and Giselle here, Giselle has, has a question um, uh, about, uh, about Paul Muldoon. So she compliments you for the excellent talk. Uh, and she asks, would you say that the conflict North, South and others in Muldoon's aesthetics plays the same central role as the land does to Hines. Well, thank you very much for that question, Giselle. Delighted to inquire, encounter you in this rather evanescent manner. Uh, yeah, I mean, good question. Uh, look, uh, uh, I think I may agree with you. Uh, uh, not, I mean, it's the conflict north-south, but also a, a, a variety of uh, uh, cross-border circumstances. That option for focusing on a uh, neither here nor there uh, 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 kind of um, uh, emplacement, you know, uh, uh, cultivating this persona that always thrives on a sense of uh, uh, displacement. And uh, if there is any stability to it, to uh, that positioning, it, it will always be a thwart, to quote, you know, that deliberately pedantic lexical choice that you got in that, uh, uh, with that line from a poem in, in, in his latest, in, in, in Frolic and Detour. And, and in fact, you know, uh, Muldoon often made a point of carving out, you know, his own space within, uh, within the Irish poetic tradition uh, in an agonistic manner, uh, sometimes humorous, sometimes not that much, uh, with regard to, to Seamus Heaney. Uh, and so I, I suppose that if we, with Heaney, we get so often a sense of, of, of a poetics of uh, emplacement and rootedness, not, not thoroughly so, because Heaney was himself, you know, uh, uh, highly aware of the challenges that that posed, of the political challenges that that posed, but nonetheless, uh, if we are to recognize in this jockeying for position that poets so often engage in with regard to predecessors, I would say, you know, that this option for a liminal, deliberately athwart positioning on the, 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 the part of Muldoon will fit in very nicely with that sense of an agonistic self-definition vis-a-vis uh, Heaney's own, uh, you know, much cultivated rootedness and emplacement. Thanks for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very, it's a very interesting uh, question about uh, the the opposition Heaney Muldoon. Every every Northern Irish poet I seem to have, uh, uh, they seem to have this idea of how where to put put themselves in relation to. He, first it was Yeats, and now now it's it's Heaney. So you have Bruce Stewart also saying hi from hi Brazil, and I have a question. Oh, thanks, <laughs> I, Lydia, yeah. I have a question. Yeah, uh, 
Bomo Dunn was a, a couple of years ago here in Cambridge reading, and he kept talking about Pessoa, and he has this kind of obsession with Fernando Pessoa. And I and I was when you were talking about the ironic personas that he is himself playing with, uh, uh, that he is kind of creating this Eurocentric privileged writer. Would you say that he's also playing with a sense of a multiplicity of personas or different selves placed on different? Um, spaces and times. Yes, definitely. I mean, what I was calling that, you know, gallivanting, I was using that, that, that word, this, uh, you know, uh, partly self-satirical representation uh, of, a, of an authorial self, you know, constantly, uh, constantly on the hop, constantly moving about, you know, from setting to setting. I mean, there has been, I suppose, recently, a certain consistency of diction that, uh, that suggests a measure of, set, of stabilization in the delineation of a prevalent persona. But it has otherwise, uh, I would agree, to be plural and to sometimes uh, involve, uh, uh, you know, well, uh, uh, well, even dramatic selves, as with the, the, the Tuareg in An Approved Road, you know, that poem from, uh, from Moise and, and Gravel, uh, and several uh, other, you know, uh, mouthpieces that were uh, poetically construed uh, in, um, uh, uh, in, in some of his uh, earlier writing. Uh, I was trying to, uh, and, and thanks for, for, for mentioning, of course, Pessoa. I mean, uh, uh, Muldoon has taken a uh, direct interest in that. And I know that one of his uh, latest uh, collections uh, included, in fact, a version, yeah, a version from Pessoa. Uh, in um, uh, 1,000 Things Worth Knowing. Sorry, there's too much light and you probably can't see the cover very well. Uh, but there's a, um, uh, there's a uh, version of a uh, poem by uh, Alvaro de Campos, one of, um, uh, uh, one of Pessoa's uh, heteronyms, uh, and, you know, a uh, modernist, uh, a modernist heteronym, uh, a poem entitled Belfast 1922, you know, that involves displacement. Uh, and so that awareness uh, of the uh, 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 Pessoan exacerbation, you know, of the uh, plurality of poetic selfhood uh, that I think is very much, uh, well, at the back of his mind, sometimes at the front, as in this case, you know, uh, of, a, uh, uh, of a version of a version from Alvaro Kemp, uh, uh, you know, rather uh, intriguingly situated in Belfast in 1922, you know, again, very much relevant to this uh, awareness that we already had uh, with the 2015 collection of the approach of this period of commemorations as regards, you know, those major developments in, uh, in Irish history a century ago, uh, you know, an awareness that, uh, as, I was, as I was pointing out, acknowledging and thanking uh, also very much pervades the, the, the program of this symposium uh, in, its, uh, in its entirety. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, Belfast 22. It's, uh, mm. it's definitely a historical mark. Mm -hmm. Any more questions from, uh, from our YouTube channel? Any comments? Any questions about, uh, about Muldoon's poetry? It's one of, I, I always find that it, it's a challenge to read Muldoon any any of his his poems because it is the it is the language as well but even though he plays with uh, the pedantic nature of, of language of finding the right term his uh, his his poems are so precise when it comes to vocabulary and you can really tell that he himself thought about those words extremely uh, extremely thoroughly uh, the, the the words that have an irish origin or the words that have an anglo-saxon origin um, mm -hmm. 
Yeah, uh, and I mean, well, yeah, uh, uh, that's uh, that's one of the key traits of what what I was uh, defining as this prevalent persona in some of the recent writing. It's it's this uh, tension between, on on the one hand, this very finicky approach to language, you know, trying to find the right word, you know, uh, sort of sort of allowing us to glimpse the author. Uh, always uh, involved, you know, in the resources or enveloped by the resources of a huge uh, library, you know, uh, uh, and trying and, and, and exploring the, the OED, the Oxford English Dictionary for all sorts of, you know, of, uh, uh, semantic uh, uh, implications and shades here and there. But this is set off uh, or set up against this civic dimension that is, you know, provocatively juxtaposed through processes such as those that I was describing as an abrupt metonymy, uh, when you get, you know, those musings on the implication of this or that word as that a thwart or other such, you know, uh, not exactly oddities, you know, but lexical occurrences that are not so common, uh, together with the uh, ostensible uh, frivolous life, you know, of the cosmopolitan and globe-trotting author, you know, in that swimming pool with the wave machine and all that, and then you get a stop, a burial mound, a synagogue, you know, and uh, and so this is sort of uh, uh, very much in your face in a way, you know, and uh, and as as a way of uh, signaling the extent to which um, uh, uh, to which um, uh, you get you get in his writing this well sometimes probably a bit uh, uneasy you know uh, uh, coexistence but uh, definitely a provocative coexistence of the um, uh, uh, of the uh, uh, intriguing traits of this persona and those deep concerns that uh, in some of these recent writing have indeed involved the global crisis of mobility of refugees and migrants, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, placed in, in complex uh, analogies with developments, well, both in Irish history and, uh, you know, the adversities, the historical adversities in a variety of elsewhere, such as Central Europe, you know, as with the, 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 that poem on Hungary, on Budapest. Mm -hmm. I can see that Lauda has a question, right? I can see that on the chat. The issue of Irish borders combined with uh, transnational uh, uh, borders. Uh, yes, a multi-directional memory and an awareness of instability in these contemporary times. Yes, thanks for, for, for noting that, Lauda. It, it in fact converges. I haven't read your note yet, but we were uh, clearly moving in the same direction, the two of us. Uh, uh, this, this, this concern with what is happening well, in areas such as well, the Mediterranean, you know, Central Europe, uh, even today, there, 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 were, there was more information. Uh, there was more information, um, well, in the global news uh, about all these incidents with, um, uh, with migrants and refugees uh, at some of the borders in Central Europe being pushed back sometimes uh, under illegal conditions, illegal under international law, as when, you know, as when, uh, uh, you know, a certain group of people arrive at the border and the border guards just forcibly take them back to the, the adjacent territory, you know, and prevent them from even positioning themselves on that, well, I'll use the word again, uh, liminal uh, situation, you know, of the, uh, of the border itself. So, so yes, this, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, awareness, this pointed awareness, and this concern with awareness raising is clearly there. And I would say that it's probably, you know, both intellectually and emotionally more effective when it is achieved through this rather, you know, sardonic and uh, uh, even capricious uh, uh, ways, you know, that have characterized some of Muldoon's writing than if we were getting outright manifestos, you know, and poems that would read like uh, manifestos. So, so thanks, Laura. Laura. And, um, uh, and thanks, Bruce, as well. I'm, I'm now reading your annotation, well, your annotation about an annotating Muldoon that would be amusing. Yes, I would agree. In so many poems, he overwhelms the reader with all these synaptic links and near homophones. Is this post-colonial language, is this post-colonial language effect or more Lewis Carroll? 
Oof, I suppose both. I mean, there, you get here in a simulation, probably, of the uh, uh, whole um, uh, well wealth of possibilities that the um, uh, that the literary traditions of, of the English language uh, uh, involve. Uh, but also, I suppose, those uh, uh, those uh, other intriguing elements that occur, and Muldoon has not been averse to, to, to evoking those either, uh, at the uh, linguistic interface on the island and in the island in, in the island's traditions between uh, between Irish and English. I suppose it's not so obvious and so uh, pointed, but it has uh, occurred, it has come up. Uh, and so I, I think it would be it would be a combination of both of those. Uh, also enriched by uh, possibilities, dimensions of wordplay uh, that come from other languages. It's not just you know things that occur in the English language and you know, that may you know. Uh, percolate to uh, Muldoon's use of English from his awareness of underlying uh, 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 underlying um, uh, Irish elements in, in, in Hiberno English. It's also, you know, a dimension of polyglossia that also that also has close affinities to uh, Muldoon's uh, emphatic interest in, in Joyce, the lord of liminality, as he was dubbing Joyce in uh, To Ireland I in his Clarendon lectures uh, back from, from 1998. And so polyglossia very much comes into these, you know, in elements from other languages that he is aware of. Uh, uh, as also seen by his uh, uh, recent interest in, in offering uh, versions from, uh, from other poetic traditions. We were uh, talking about, well, that Alvin uh, de Campus poem, uh, but, uh, but it's, not, it's not a single instance. There are, there are more, of course. Fascinating. Any any more any more questions? Any more comments? I'm very much aware that this is still early morning for for, for you in Brazil. Here it's close to two uh, in the very early afternoon <laughs> in, in in Portugal. Yes, yeah. it's, it's four hour four hour difference. Yeah, there as well. But I'm I'm very grateful that I've had you know a loyal and committed audience that have even asked questions, you know, uh, even if it's an early morning slot and the, that may have involved you know, for, for, for many of you uh, an additional effort. Well, I think if we don't have any any more questions of like, um, uh, yes, I'd like to thank everybody for for being here, for watching uh, Professor uh, Rui's talk. And Just plain uh, Rui, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, Bruce, if you're, if you're willing, I invite you to do the annotated Muldoon, maybe. <laughs> we, would all, we would all benefit from that. Oh, yeah, we would greatly profit from it. <laughs> And uh, Laura is, uh, is thanking you, and um, thank uh, so uh, thank you so much, uh, so much to reflect upon the power to, of poetry, and that's that's very uh, kind of you, Laura. Thank you. That's really uh, great. Uh, so thank you, and um, yes, I hope to see you soon. Yeah, let's hope we will all at some point soon be able to well meet again and find ourselves within a, uh, a lecture room that will not just be virtual. Uh, however pleasant this was to have the opportunity to uh, 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 see, well, your names and some of you, in fact, I mean, your faces on, on screen. Uh, warm thanks again uh, for, uh, uh, for this very, well, for this honor. It was great to address this symposium uh, and all the best for all of you. Bye for now. Bye.